Welcome Vintage Hollywood Archive. Two little rich friends, who later developed an infamous rivalry, ultimately shared a similar tragic fate, proving their lifelong jealousy was absolutely pointless. How money destroyed Doris Dukes and Barbara Hutton's friendship. Make sure to watch the video until the end, and if you are new here, don't forget to join our wonderful community by subscribing to our channel. Doris Duke and Barbara Hutton's Rivalry World's Richest Heiresses Barbara Woolworth Hutton was a debutante, socialite, heiress, and philanthropist from the United States. She earned the title Poor Little Rich Girl after having a luxurious and expensive debutante ball during the Great Depression in 1930, and later due to a notably complicated private life. Doris Duke was the daughter of James Buchanan Duke, the Tobacco King, and was born about 10 days after Hutton. Doris's father is said to have left her an estate worth up to $1.3 billion in today's money when he died. The majority of his wealth came from his Lucky Strike cigarette company, which was the top-selling brand in the 1930s. With the two heiresses in the same social class, you would think that they would have been best friends. Yes, they were, at least while they were teenagers. In 1925, when Doris was about 12 years old, her father passed away. On his deathbed, he advised his daughter not to trust anyone and bestowed her his whole estate. Doris lived by those words, whereas Hutton did not. The rivalry between the girls would be fueled by their opposing lifestyles. Doris was very cautious and guarded with her inheritance and the people she was with because of her father's final words. Barbara Hutton was not as cautious as Doris. Instead, Hutton was very free spending with her inheritance which made her popular in the magazines. Hutton's belief in extravagant spending also caused her to call Doris cheap. On one occasion, Hutton was invited by Doris to stay at her mansion in Hawaii. While Hutton was a guest there, she decided to redecorate, which outraged Doris, and she kicked Hutton out. Doris was very jealous of Hutton's beauty. The two would often compete with their looks and fashion, each wanting the top spot on the most beautiful and best dressed list. The two also married the same man, which intensified their rivalry. After long envy and competition, they both shared a similar fate and ended up being bedridden, withdrawn from the world, and leaving all the wealth behind. Wonder how rich girls turned into poor rich girls? Let's take a deep look at the glamorous yet ultimately tragic lives of Barbara Hutton and Doris Duke, the original Poor Little Rich Girls. While Doris inherited her father James Buchanan Duke's estate, Barbara also inherited her late mother's one-third of wealth from her grandfather Frank W. Woolworth, $80 million estate after the death of her grandmother in 1924. Because they were juveniles, their fortunes were placed in the trust, managed by outsiders, and were given significant living allowances. Their daily lives included private railroad cars, bodyguards, and armies of servants to attend their demands. The public's attention was drawn to these young girls who had been lavished with everything money could buy. The popular press dubbed them the Gold Dust Twins, since they were both from New York City, were born a week apart, and had comparable fortunes. The title Twins would be an exaggeration though they were clearly friendly. They were shuttled between their several residences, rarely staying in one area for more than a few months at a period, and they were watched over by vigilant retainers. It was scarcely an environment that fostered close ties among contemporaries outside their own family circles. However, both lost a parent when they were young. Both received tens of millions of dollars when the average household income was less than $2,000 per year, and both had their lives discussed by the media. They were members of a very exclusive sorority, with life circumstances that few could contemplate, let alone comprehend. This forged a bond, if not a strong friendship, between them. Barbara went to Miss Potter's in Farmington while she was in her teens. She was shy, fat, and self-conscious, and by all accounts, she was unhappy. Doris, who was more extroverted and confident, went to Brearley in Manhattan. In 1930, at the start of the Great Depression, they both came out to society. Doris's ball, held in August at Rough Point, the Duke Cottage in Newport, drew 600 guests, including Barbara. Doris was one of the 1,000 people that attended Barbara's party at the Ritz-Carlton in New York in December. When they turned 21, they began to inherit the principal of their well-invested fortunes.
Barbara's is estimated to be $50 million, and Doris's is estimated to be $70 million, leading them into a lifetime of extravagant spending on homes, jewels, and husbands. Barbara grew into a porcelain-skinned beauty. Doris, though attractive, had sharper features, but was not regarded conventionally attractive by the standards of the day. Barbara, who had been anorexic her whole life, was the spendthrift of the two, buying homes, polo ponies, and priceless jewels. Hutton began collecting jewels when she was a child. For instance, it is said that Hutton purchased a chain from Queen Amelia of Portugal and ordered for the stones of the necklace to be removed and turned into a tiara. She gave money to friends and associates. Each had a small circle of hang-ons who jockeyed for influence and were quick to manipulate their natural insecurities. Some of their friends began to insinuate a rivalry between them in a subtle way. When one of the sycophants noticed a magnificent rock crystal chandelier in Doris's home, she sarcastically asked her in front of everyone, Doris, what are you doing with one of Barbara's earrings? Everyone laughed, knowing Barbara's taste for costly jewelry. Even though they were said in mockery, comments like these about one ultimately found their way back to the other. Though the friendship remained intact, the seeds of distrust, competition, and jealousy were planted subtly. Psychics and faith healers grabbed their attention, as did the numerous lovers and big dame hunters who pursued them from Hawaii to Hollywood to the Riviera. Doris had affairs with her surfing teacher and others after divorcing her first husband, James Cromwell. Doris had Shangri-La, a huge Moroccan-style resort in Hawaii, built for her. It was designed to look like a Middle Eastern palace and hold her rare collection of Islamic art. She brought in a pair of camels to roam the lawn to provide a touch of authenticity. On the other side of the world, Barbara bought a 16th century palace in Tangier called Sidi Hosni, which she filled with another trove of Middle Eastern art and antiques, including a million-dollar jewel-encrusted tapestry. There, she would throw legendary parties, mixing European aristocrats and Boudouin tribesmen who brought their own camels. Barbara gave birth to her son Lance in London in 1936. Despite the fact that she was on the verge of death due to complications, he was a healthy, active child. Doris had a daughter named Arden, who was naturally more healthy and athletic. The infant, who was born prematurely and in poor health, died just 24 hours after her birth. The press loved contrasting and comparing the two, portraying them as closest friends and later enemies. Barbara married seven times, and her husbands included a baron, three princes, a count, a playboy, and actor Cary Grant. They were called Cash and Cary by the tabloids. Doris married twice, once to a gold-digging socialite James Cromwell, and then in 1947 to famed Dominican playboy Porfirio Ruby Ruby Rosa, who was reported to be very well endowed. In Paris, waiters would be ordered to pass me the ruby, which meant pass me the bigger pepper mills. It was an obvious mismatch, aside from her having a vast fortune and him needing one. They separated a year later when Doris attempted suicide by slitting her wrists. Doris handed Ruby a string of polo ponies, a modified B-52 bomber, many costly sports cars, and a townhouse in Paris as parting gifts when they separated, to make up for the meager $500,000 financial payout her smart lawyers had negotiated in their prenuptial agreement. Several years later, Ruby, short on cash and engaged in a feud with his present sweetheart, Jaja Gabor, set his sights on Barbara. She had recently divorced her fourth spouse and was becoming increasingly vulnerable and easily manipulated. She chose to marry him after being swept off her feet by his attentions. Her family was furious. Her aunt, Jessie Donahue, advised her to call her old friend Doris for an unvarnished opinion of the man, sure that she would reason with Barbara and clear the air. Doris assured Barbara that Ruby was a great gentleman and a delightful partner, which Barbara duly conveyed to her aunt. On New Year's Day, 1954, Doris was in Geneva when she read the international newspaper headline, Ruby and Barbara Hutton Wed. A friend tried to console her, but Doris, furious and inebriated, began spitting up curses about Barbara. She said her rival had always been jealous of her. She always wanted what I have. Barbara gifted her new husband with a check of $1 million, a coffee plantation in the Dominican Republic, another B-52 bomber, polo ponies, jewelry, and reported $2.5 million as a settlement. But unfortunately, their marriage lasted only 53 days, costing Barbara a great deal of worldwide public humiliation. Doris purred condolences to Barbara over the phone, 
though it was Doris who misguided Barbara. Meanwhile, Doris started flirting with Barbara's ex, Cary Grant. Nothing came of it, much to Doris's regret. Later, when Doris, looking youthful after a series of plastic surgeries, was dating much younger jazz musician Joe Castro, Barbara telephoned him. She said, I'd give you more than she would. If you were with me, you'd have a symphony orchestra. As the years passed, their roles in the public eyes reversed. Barbara, addicted to alcohol and barbiturates, began to age rapidly, looking older than her age. Doris maintained her lean athletic body and sharp features, wore the bright styles and dramatic hairstyles of the 60s well. At one point, Barbara, divorced from husband number six, was feeling disconsolate and on the edge. Doris, perhaps feeling guilty about her role in the whole Ruby Rosa contretemps, offered Barbara the use of Shangri-La as a retreat. Barbara accepted and flew to Hawaii for some rest and a comeback. After a couple of weeks there, feeling a burst of energy and confidence, Barbara looked around and determined that she would do Doris a favor and freshen the place up a bit. Doris's priceless Islamic antiques and ornate Middle Eastern style furnishings were carted off, replaced with more minimal and modern-looking Japanese pieces. When finished, the interiors of Shangri-La looked particularly similar to those at Sumia, Barbara's Japanese-style home in Kernavaca. Doris returned, took one look, and was outraged. The two stopped talking, and Doris told everyone she knew that Barbara had indeed gone over the edge. Soon enough, Barbara had her chance to have the last word. They both experienced scandals and saucy tabloid headlines. Perhaps the most devastating story was of Edward Turilla, a handsome interior decorator who was doing some work for Doris at Rough Point in Newport. Doris was driving home from a party one night in 1966 with Edward Turilla. When Turilla got out of the car to open the gates of the estate, Doris's foot, according to her testimony, accidentally slipped off of the brake and onto the gas. The car leapt forward, crushing Turilla against the gates, killing him instantly. The official investigation considered the whole incident an unfortunate accident, and a $75,000 payment kept Turilla's family from filing a wrongful death suit. The press asked Barbara her opinion, and she didn't miss the chance. She said, Perhaps Doris didn't like his taste. She certainly didn't care for mine. And thus, the friendship officially ended. Barbara carried on for another decade, her behavior becoming increasingly unpredictable and bizarre. She eventually stopped walking on her own after a hip injury, claiming she could pay others to do it for her and demanding to be carried everywhere. She also started to go blind. Unfortunately, it seems that Barbara Hutton was never able to escape the sadness and tragedy of her life. While she did have happy moments and times, the last few years of her journey were filled with tragedy, struggles, and illness. Of course, one of the toughest times of Hutton's life happened when her only child, Lance, passed away in a plane accident in 1972. Like most parents who have encountered such a devastating loss, Hutton never got over the loss of her son. Those who were closest to her state that Hutton began to lose interest in living when she heard the news that her son had passed. She lost most of her fortune and died of a heart attack in her suite at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel in 1979, bedridden and withdrawn from the world. After spending a huge amount of money on shopping and her husband's all her life, when Barbara Hutton died, she had only $3,500. Barbara Hutton went from one of the wealthiest women in the world to nearly penniless. Doris, whose wealth had been wisely managed to prosper to over a billion dollars, continued to be active, living lavishly for several more decades with ever-increasing various attendants in tow, including Imelda Marcos, a 37-year-old belly dancer whom she eventually adopted, and the two camels, which she had flown between her residences, depending on where she happened to be staying at the time. Eventually, her alcoholic Irish butler, Bernard Lafferty, managed to isolate and, many say, drug her. Although her fortune remained intact, she grew increasingly paranoid and mistrustful of everyone but Lafferty. By 1993, after complications from a fall, Doris, at 81, was in a hospital bed in her Los Angeles home, addicted to antidepressants, painkillers, sleeping pills, and alcohol. Dazed and confused, she was skinny. She ultimately shared a similar fate as her frenemy, Barbara, when she died bedridden, cut off from her friends in the world, under slightly unlikely circumstances in 1993. When tobacco heiress Doris Duke died, she left a will that shocked even those who had known her best. Ignoring Shandy Hefner, 
the latter-day flower child whom she adopted in 1988. Duke left the authority of the majority of her wealth worth $1.2 billion estates to Bernard Lafferty, her butler of six years. Barbara and Doris spent their whole lives competing with each other. However, they couldn't compete for a better ending. Rivalries in this sector have never been a rarity in high society. Sometimes they get out of hand, and the ending of the story is not a happy ending. Watch this video and find out what fueled Gina Lolo Brigida and Sophia Loren's rivalry.